You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Congratulations. You've reached the Amelia Project. A new life awaits. If you're not serious about this, hang up. If you continue, there's no way back. Leave your message after the beep. Enter the offices of the Amelia Project and be ready for surprises, twists and turns. Follow the Amelia team as they help their clients fake their deaths and come back with new identities. Each episode is different. Each client coming to the death faking agency has a unique story to tell. If death and disappearances, comedy and crime, mystery and magic sounds like your cup of... Coco, The Amelia Project is the podcast for you. Search for The Amelia Project wherever you find your podcasts. And remember, leave your message after the beep. Hi, I'm Annie, back in the U.S. after a lovely trip to Norway and the U.K. that I'm going to be telling you more about at a later date. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. You just heard the promo for the Amelia Project, and I know I recommended this podcast already a while ago as my something good. For all of you who still haven't listened to it, please go there after finishing this episode. It's an amazing fiction podcast about a secret agency that helps a very eclectic clientele to disappear and start a new life by faking their own deaths. The story is so good and funny. The voice actors are amazing and I honestly can't recommend this podcast enough. So please check it out. And if you like it, leave them a rating. Or even better, a review and tell them we sent you. So, that's the first thing. A couple of other things we need to tell you about before we get into today's episode. You know, we usually try to tell you all the stuff at the end, unless it's really important and we don't want you to miss it because you've already fallen asleep or because your lunch break is over. We really try to be quick. Uh, First of all, some people kept asking us if there is a way to support our show without joining Patreon. And now there finally is. If you use the Podbean app to listen to us, or if you go to patreon.podbean.com slash Fresh Hell Podcast, you can now become a member and support Fresh Hell. We only insert a very small number of sponsored ads in our episode because we really don't like it when you get interrupted too much when listening. So our supporters on Patreon and on Podbean are the main way of how we are able to create our episodes every week. And we thank you so much for it. Yeah, thank you so much. And while we're at it, we'd love to give a huge shout out to our newest Patreon members, Alison Lowry and Stephanie Bledsoe-Coddle. Thank you so much. Thank you. The other really important thing, tomorrow, Saturday, 1st of July, starts the slate voting for the People's Choice Podcast Award. That's right. Please go to podcastawards.com and vote for us in the categories of True Crime, Best Female Hosted, History, and People's Choice. We have won Best Female hosted twice, and last year we won Best History, so we would love Mm -hmm. to defend those titles. When you register, please don't forget to check the box. There'll be a box asking you if you would like to be considered to vote for the winners. These are people who are randomly selected, and for those who opt in, they decide the winners once the nominating period is over. So right now, you're voting for us to make it through nominations into final voting. And the people who tick that box, there's a random selection chosen for the final voting. So they actually decide the winners. And uh, we would really appreciate it. It takes a minute or two to do. And that's a really great way to help us without spending a penny or compromising your privacy because they don't share your information with anyone. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's the most important announcements for now. If you want to know more, please, please listen until the end of the episode. Because now it's time to talk about today's case. 
In the last weeks, I was listening to the Bad Women podcast by Hayley Rubenhold, who also wrote the somewhat controversial book, The Five, about five of the victims of Jack the Ripper. Uh, one of our Hellions had recommended the podcast and the book. And so I was listening. It's a really interesting podcast, even though I don't agree with all of it, but it definitely gives some food for thought. Uh, so please go check it out as well. And in the podcast, they mention some of the popular suspects at the time. If you followed our recommendations for the Art of Crime podcast of season one, you already know all of these famous suspects like painter Walter Sickert, for example. And so in the Bad Woman podcast, they mentioned that at the time there was a Texan serial killer who was believed to have traveled from Texas to London and continued the killing spree there. Kind of the H.H. H. Holmes theory by Holmes' great-great-grandson, Jeff Matchett. I'm sure many of you saw American Ripper, right? So I haven't yet, but it's very interesting to me. And I think it's always interesting when you have people like Mudgett ancestors trying to figure out who else might have been a victim, just like you have people convinced that their family member murdered the Black Dahlia. It's so interesting, though, isn't it, to like... Very, yeah. Yeah. So... The Texas serial killer believed to be Jack the Ripper. Who was that? I had never heard about it, or so I thought. And I googled it, and it did ring a bell in one of the far, far hidden corners of my brain. Dusty, shadowed old <laughs> yeah. corner. <laughs> yeah. They were talking about the Austin X murderer, or also called the Servant Girl Annihilator. That's another name the press had given the killer, and we're going to talk about uh, that more in the second episode next yeah. week, why that's kind of a, not such a good name. It's not, and that's, the, that's definitely how I had originally learned of this case. And just like Jack the Ripper or the Villisca ex-murderer or the X-Men of New Orleans, the Austin ex-murderer was never caught. And because this is the podcast with all the exes all the time, we thought mm -hmm. this is right up our alley. The biggest source for these two episodes is the book The Servant Girl Murders Austin, Texas, 1885 by J.R. Galloway from 2010. It's really such a great resource. The author collected over 100 newspaper clippings in the book, so it was very helpful. Uh, there is also a web page that, go that goes with it, servantgirlmurders.com where Mr. Galloway collected as much information about the victims as possible, which was very clearly not easy because the victims were mostly African-American servants and there's just not a lot of info out there. J.R. Galloway, who works for the University of Texas Libraries, did what we usually do. He went through all the records and census and whatever he could find to try and keep the victims' memories alive. Mm -hmm. Huge shout out to J.R. Galloway. Thank you for your hard work. Hellions, please go check out the webpage. All right, now travel with us to Austin, Texas. For those of you who don't really know anything about Austin, like me, here are some basic facts for you. Austin is the capital city of Texas, and like most places on this beautiful planet, it has a rich and vibrant history that spans centuries. There is evidence of Native American tribes inhabiting the region as far back as 9200 BC. The most prominent tribes in the region were, and I'm hopefully pronouncing these correctly, the Tonkawa, the Lipan Apache, and the Comanche. The Tonkawa people were one of the major Native American groups in central Texas. They were hunter-gatherers who lived along the rivers and streams, including the Colorado River where Austin is located. They were also extremely skilled horsemen. The Lipan Apache, a branch of the Apache tribe, also resided in the area. They were nomadic hunters and gatherers who roamed across Texas, including the hill country around Austin. The Comanche, one of the most powerful Native American tribes in Texas, had a significant presence in the Austin area. They were fierce warriors and skilled horsemen who controlled a vast territory, including parts of central Texas. The Comanche often clashed with both European settlers who started to arrive in the 1830s and other Native American tribes as they sought to maintain their dominance over the region. It really has nothing to do with this episode, but uh, it's still important for us to note that Native American tribes in Texas, including those around Austin, faced significant displacement, violence, and loss of their lands as European colonization progressed. I mean, it's part of history, right? And that's what we're here for. 
the arrival of settlers and the formation of the Republic of Texas and later the state of Texas led to the marginalization and forced removal of many Native American communities. Also, what you might want to know, Texas used to be part of Mexico. It gained independence from Mexico in 1836 and existed as an independent republic for nearly a decade before becoming a part of the United States on 29th of December 1845. So in 1845, the U.S. Congress passed a joint resolution offering annexation to Texas. On 4th of July 1845, the people of Texas voted in favor of annexation and on 29th of December of the same year, Texas was admitted to the Union as the 28th state. The annexation of Texas sparked tensions with Mexico, which still claimed Texas as its territory, and eventually this all led up to the Mexican-American War in 1846. It is also worth noting that the Republic of Texas, while independent, maintained a close relationship with the United States. Many prominent figures from Texas played very crucial roles in the formation of the Republic, including Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin, and they sought to align Texas with the United States due to concerns about the security and economic development. And this is where the history of Austin starts, with Stephen F. Austin, who is often referred to as the father of Texas. In 1835, he led a group of pioneers and they established a settlement along the banks of the Colorado River. The settlement was originally named Waterloo, but was later renamed Austin to honor Stephen F. Austin. The area was chosen for its fertile land, proximity to water, and strategic location in central Texas. Austin quickly grew and became the capital of the Republic of Texas in 1839 after Texas gained independence from Mexico. The city's location at the edge of the Texas Hill Country made it an ideal spot for settlement, and the Texas government recognized its potential as a center for education and culture. And of course, at one point, the railroad arrived, and we talked about the importance of the railroad in U.S. history and how problematic the construction of tracks and tunnels were. You know, I think we've covered that several times already. Yeah. But in the late 19th century, Austin's growth was boosted by the arrival of said railroad, which improved transportation and brought new opportunity for trade and commerce. The University of Texas was established in Austin in 1883 and played a significant role in the city's development as an educational and intellectual hub. During the 20th century, Austin continued to grow and diversify its economy. In the 1960s and 1970s, the city became a center for counterculture and focal point of the emerging music scene. It gained a reputation as the, quote, live music capital of the world and hosted renowned music festivals such as South by Southwest and Austin City Limits. In the 1980s, Austin's technology industry began to flourish, earning it the name Silicon Hills. I've never heard that term before. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just not in the know. The city attracted numerous technology companies, including Dell, who I have heard of, and became a significant center for innovation and entrepreneurship. Watch, I'm going to get, like, scathing letters from the Silicon Hills <laughs> Preservation Association or something. I don't know. Come for me. It's fine. Austin's population continued to surge in the 21st century, fueled by a strong economy, job opportunities, and quality of life. It became one of the fastest-growing cities in the United States, with a reputation for its vibrant cultural scene, outdoor activities, and progressive values. Today, Austin is a thriving metropolis with a diverse population, renowned for live music, film festivals, outdoor spaces, and booming technology sector. It retains its status as the capital of Texas and continues to attract people from all over the world who are drawn to its unique blend of history, culture, and modernity. And when we checked for what to see or do in Austin, we found the following. And I'm sure it's something that most of our Hellions would enjoy. I know that I am planning a pilgrimage here at some point, and I'm taking you all with me. All right. This is from, quote, 15 top-rated tourist attractions in Austin, Texas. From planetware.com. Number six, see the bats from Congress Avenue Bridge. Yes. Okay. One of Austin's most unique things to do is spectating the evening flight of the Mexican free-tailed bats that roost under Ann W. Richards' Congress Avenue Bridge. Up to one and a half million of these insect-devouring critters take to the sky at dusk each evening from March through November, comprising of the world's largest urban bat colony. 
The result is a stunning display as they fly from beneath the bridge and up to two miles high in massive formations, so they can dine on mosquitoes, moths, grasshoppers, and other flying pests. It can take up to 45 minutes just for the fuzzy mammals to all exit their home. Once the pups, babies, are old enough, they accompany their mothers on the evening flight. There are many vantage points from which to enjoy the sight, with the area surrounding the bridge the most popular. Others enjoy watching from boats on Lady Bird Lake or from the Statesman Bat Observation Center, which sits at the southern end of the bridge. In conjunction with Bat Conservation International, the center is an ecotourism destination, striving to increase awareness of bats and educate the public on their importance. End quote. Yeah, I am definitely, definitely planning to go and see the bats. I've, I've never been to Texas. Uh, me neither. And one thing I have to say about Texas, the Texan accent is by far, by far, my favorite US accent. <laughs> I just love it. It feels so warm and cozy and welcoming. It's, it, uh, it's the best. Also, Matthew McGonaghy is from Austin, as is Richard Linklater, who not only directed Dazed and Confused with McGonaghy, but also the Before Trilogy. So Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight. And the first one, before sunrise is set in Vienna. And that's how the circle closes. Mm, nice. I like it. The full circle. So today they live around 980,000 people in Austin, but we are more interested in Austin in the 1880s because that's when this takes place. And the census tells us that in 1880, 11,000 people lived in Austin. That might not seem much compared to today, but as we said before, at that time, Austin saw a lot of growth. In only 30 years, the population had grown from 629 in 1850 to said 11,000. So just like in all other growing cities around the world, job opportunities pulled a lot of people in, looking to make a better life for themselves. One of them was Molly Smith. The African-American girl was born in 1857 in Virginia, where slavery was still legal at the time, and had moved to Waco, Texas in the 1870s. Somewhere around that time, she apparently gave birth to a son, George, and in Waco, she worked as a servant for the Rogers household. Head of the house was F. O. Rogers, the county tax collector, and F. O. stands for Friend Ovid, which I find an interesting name. Yeah. Friend as a first friend. name, is that? Yeah. It sounds like that's, I feel like that's a name that you see more in certain religious populations. Yeah, I was thinking the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. According to the census, her son George was living with her at that time, and after a while Molly moved to Austin to seek employment, and then back again to Waco and so on. And as far as I read, her son George stayed with the Rogers family, giving some people grounds for speculating that maybe George's father was Robert Rogers, the son of F.O. Rogers. He had lived in his family home at the time, and he was around the same age as Molly, but as I said, we don't know for sure, and it's just speculation. Yeah, and I mean, it could have been his father. It could have been at that time and place for a young black woman. Mm. I think the best we can hope is that the child was the result of a consensual mm. encounter, and the decision to leave the child was also hers. You know, I think that's probably the best we can hope for, without making any kind of judgment on anybody about anything. But this woman has not had an easy life. So she was also reported as being mulatto, which is an outdated term for someone of mixed parentage, generally black and white, African and European. And of course, no matter how light your skin might be, if you were seen as mulatto, you would still be below the class of a white woman. But this is possibly why she was able to move around with more freedom. That was the case when we covered Robert Johnson, his mother and grandmother, because of their fairer skin, you know, had a little bit more opportunity. You'll hear some outdated terms for African American or Black people in this episode. We're going to primarily be using the term African American ourselves due to the time and place, because this is all happening like immediately post-abolition. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're doing our best. In 1884, Molly was in Austin once more. She was working for the family of Walter Hall on West Pecan or Pecan? Mm, who can what say? What do they say in Texas? Pecan, I think. 
on West Pecan Street or Pecan. I don't know how. I don't know either. I know there are two different ways how people pronounce it. And I don't know how it's pronounced in Texas, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say Pecan. I don't know. I feel like I feel like members of my own family pronounce it differently. Tell us how you pronounce it. Doesn't really matter because nowadays that is called West Sixth uh, Street in Austin. They mm. still have the pecan or whatever street festival <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> I looked at photos and it looks fun. So there's that to visit. Molly was living in the house of Walter Hall and his family. But she isn't living there alone. With her is her boyfriend at the time, a man named Walter Spencer. They were not married, but they were able to live together in the whole residence, in a room or I think rather a small apartment in the back of the house. On the night of 30th December 1884 to 31st of December 1884, somewhere between 3 and 4 a.m., Walter Spencer entered the bedroom of a man named Thomas Chalmers. And that's the brother-in-law of Mr. Walter Spencer, who was staying at the residence at the time. So Mr. Chalmers woke up and saw Mr. Spencer all covered in blood, bleeding from several deep wounds. And uh, Walter says, quote, Mr. Tom, for God's sake, do something to help me. Somebody has nearly killed me, end quote. And Walter also said that Molly was gone and he couldn't find her anywhere. And Thomas Chalmers tells Walter Spencer to go see a doctor. And that's pretty much it for now. It's a bit bizarre and I'm trying to understand and I hope and assume that Thomas maybe thought that Walter had come home wounded. Maybe he assumed that he had been out drinking or, or something and had gotten into trouble and when he came home wounded and bleeding Molly had just gotten upset and they fought and she just left because otherwise I don't know. It's not mm -hmm. so great, I think. Yeah, I think this time you're the one that's being optimistic and I'm like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to put, obviously, motives or thoughts because we don't know. But my first instinct is they just don't care. Yeah. Walter and Molly are probably seen as less valuable than livestock. I hope I'm wrong about that, but I don't think it would be an unusual position in America immediately post-abolition. You know, mm -hmm. it's... I would love it if that was the case that, you know, he's this benevolent employer, but... I don't think they had a lot of help with this one. So, okay, Walter goes to see a doctor and he gets his wound looked at and then his brother picks him up and takes him to his place where he stays for the rest of the night or rather early morning. Around 9 a.m., a servant in one of the neighboring houses was out in the garden behind their home and he saw something weird in the neighbor's garden. So, in Walter Hall's garden. Something was lying there, and if he wouldn't know it any better, he would think it was a body. He reported the matter to his employer, and they went over to the whole residence, and together, they investigated. There, behind the outhouse, they found the body of 26 or 27-year-old Molly Smith. This is from the Austin American Statesman from 1st of January 1885, which was a Thursday, and this is page four, and it's just an excerpt. Quote, There lay the woman, stark dead, a ghastly object to behold. A horrible hole on the side of her head told the tale. The reason she had not been discovered earlier was that she lay immediately behind a small outhouse, and no one thought of looking for her there. From the outhouse to the room where she slept was about 50 steps, so the unfortunate victim of the brutal attack had been dragged to the spot where her dead body was found. All the circumstances go to show that the murder was committed in the room where the two were sleeping. Later in the day, a statesman man repaired to the scene of the tragedy. He was first shown the woman still lying in the yard. But a brief glance at the sickening sight was sufficient. She was a light-colored mulatto, apparently about 25 years of age. A distinct trail on the ground leading to her door showed where the inhumane fiend had dragged her. She was nearly nude when the first discovered. Inside the room there were evidences of a desperate struggle. A broken looking glass, disarranged furniture and bloody finger marks on the door showed that a fight for life, silent and unseen save by the principals but obstinate to the end, had taken place. The pillows and sheets were bathed in blood and sanguinary stains were all over the floor. Beside the foot of the bed lay an axe, beyond doubt the instrument of the crime as it too was bloodstained. Who used it? There lies the mystery, end quote. By the way, the ex dimension, they knew pretty soon that this must have been the attack weapon as it didn't belong to the house, so the intruder had actually brought it with him. 
And at first, of course, it was speculated that Walter had attacked and murdered Molly in a fit of jealousy, probably, or that it might have been a former lover from Waco. But once they had brought in Walter Spencer for questioning, it appeared as if Walter was indeed innocent and that most likely Molly's former boyfriend from Waco, a man named William Brooks, was the culprit. This is from the same article. So they're calling in Walter now to question him, quote, The wounded man was next called on. He was in a pitiable plight, but was able to speak, though with a somewhat indistinct utterance. There were five facial hurts, the most serious one being a puncture under the eye, fracturing the orbital bone. Dr. Bart, the city physician, had found a part of the bone pressed back into the cavity against the eyeball and had pulled it forward into place. Ugh. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like eye stuff. (laughs) No, no, no. Though badly hurt, the doctor thinks the chances of recovery are favorable. His statement was made in a clear way as follows. Quote, It was sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock Tuesday night that I went to Molly's room. She complained of being sick and asked me if I wasn't sorry for her. She also told me to wake her up early the next morning. I don't remember anything else that happened till I woke and found myself hurt. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't Molly. I thought somebody had killed me. Molly was not in the room and I never saw her anymore. I went round in front of the house, woke Mr. Chalmers and told him what had happened. He told me to go to the doctor. I went out the back way and noticed that the gate was wide open, though I recollected having fastened it. End quote. Hmm. Brooks, by the way, did have an alibi for the night of the murder. Uh, He had been at a ball with a friend and I thought it was pretty soon very clear that he also couldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, poor Molly Smith becomes the first canonical victim of the Austin Axe murderer. But she wouldn't stay the only one. It looks as if crime was running rampant in Austin at the time. From the end of December 1884 to summer of 1885, many nightly break-ins had been reported. One witness, a German immigrant girl, testified that she was awakened to the sight of a man next to her bed demanding money. When she started to scream, he hit her on the head with a stone several times. In another instance, an African-American woman woke up because someone was rattling at her entrance door trying to get in. She screamed, which woke up her husband, who grabbed a gun and fired twice through the door. This is also very similar to the X-Men case. Remember, they were also shooting through through doors or through I do. walls, Evan, because they were already, like... Panicked that it really? was going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think the Nola Axeman was a lot stealthier. But I really don't like all the nighttime acts sneakiness. It's not, I'm not a fan. So, of course, the disturbed intruder or intruders took off, but not without throwing rocks at the house. That, I find that part a little odd. Like, Mm. I don't know why that bothers me, but it does. There were a lot of nightly marauders and violent criminals roaming the streets of Austin in 1885. I really wish we would have crime statistics from back in the day. You know, if if all of a sudden crime was an increase in crime, or if it was like constant but just reported more in the in the newspaper or things like that, I think that would be really interesting. It would be very interesting. Yeah. So in the book we mentioned as our main source, which is the Servant Girl Murders, you can read a lot of newspaper clippings and reports on the crimes. And even though witnesses mentioned the intruders as being white men just as often as they reported them being black or Asian, there was a lot of racial prejudice and profiling festering in the city, and the newspapers did their best to further pour gasoline on it, right? Because obviously the more inflamed people are, the more papers you're going to sell. They called for citizens to take actions on their own to protect their wives, their children, their homes, as the police were clearly incapable of protecting the good people of Austin. So. You can imagine the frenzy that the people of Austin must be in at this point. On the 19th of March, 1885, two Swedish maids were attacked in the home of their employer, Mr. J.H. Pope. Clara Strand and Christine Martinson were sleeping in their room in a small building next to the main house when they were woken up by someone knocking on their door around 1 a.m. One of the girls, Clara, got up, lit a candle, and went to see what was the matter when all of a sudden... Someone fired a shot through one of the windows. The bullet injured the girl's neck, and she fled from the room, screaming in horror. But when she ran out of the room, someone tried to grab her and overpower her. Fortunately, Clara was able to fight her attacker off, 
and her screams for help alarmed other members of the household who came running to her aid. Christine, the other maid, had run to the kitchen, where she was hit in the back by another shot fired through the window. She was injured midway between the shoulder blade and the spine, which could have ended very badly, but almost miraculously at this time period, right? She was able to recover from that injury. The attacker or attackers were able to escape, but it's believed that Clara and Christine were also two victims of the Austin axe murderer, who now I'm like the axe axe and gun murderer, the Mm. murderer to get you in the night with whatever means available. That's the scariest and seems maybe the truest, right? There's just someone in the night fucking coming for you and you don't know when or how. No thanks. In May of 1885, the Austin Axe murderer claimed his second murder victim, and her name was Eliza Shelley. She was once again an African-American maid in the home of the Johnson family on Cypress Street. Just like Molly Smith, Eliza had been born in 1857 somewhere in Texas. We're not sure if she has a birth certificate or not. It wasn't uncommon for black people and black children not to be issued birth certificates. I mean, that's something that kind of goes through even today. Like, there are people around today whose grandparents don't have birth certificates, which creates all kinds of trouble. So, in 1885, Eliza was working as a cook for Dr. Johnson and his family, and she lived on the family's property in a little cabin in the back, and with her uh, were her three children. Her husband, Ike, had been arrested in 1879. We don't know why exactly. Maybe he just stood too close to the wrong person. But whatever the reason, he was imprisoned at the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville from 1879 until November of 1885. Eliza had been working for the Johnsons for quite a while. She was reliable, hardworking as a cook, but also just a really good, kind, decent person, clearly devoted to her husband and to her children. She was reported to be an excellent mother. On the morning of May 7th, 1885, Mrs. Johnson heard screams coming from Eliza's cabin in the back, and she sent her young niece to go check on, see what was going on. Well, the girl returns moments later, and she's obviously traumatized. She's white as a ghost, definitely in shock, and she's telling her aunt that something horrible must have happened to Eliza. They go, and they find Eliza's body in her room on the floor, There was a hatchet wound over her right eye that was described as being two by two inches, which would be five by five centimeters. The murder weapon had penetrated the skull and injured the brain. Her body showed other non-fatal wounds that might have been caused by another weapon. She also had two deep round wounds over her ear and another one between her eyes. The room was in total chaos. A lot of Eliza's belongings were scattered all over the floor. There was blood everywhere. The pillows and sheets were soaked in blood, which indicated that Eliza was actually killed in her bed and then dragged onto the floor. According to the examination, her death would have been almost instantaneous. Or, if there was that much blood, at least she was unconscious instantaneous. I think this is just one of those moments where we can just hope that she was asleep and then unconscious and never, Mm. never had any inkling that anything had happened. Unlike the first murder, there was no murder weapon found in the cabin, no hatchet, nothing. The only thing that they could find were some foot imprints, one set of bare feet that were outside leading up to the cabin, and then away from it again. The feet were rather short but wide, like mine, and they didn't match Eliza or her children. So it's safe to assume that these were the imprints of the attacker. Now this is the really, really heartbreaking part of this story. So, as we said before, Eliza had three boys who lived with her in this little cabin. The oldest one was eight, and he was questioned as a witness, and he said that a man had entered the room, and he wasn't sure if the man was white or black, because the man had covered his face with a white rag, but he thought he looked like a white man. He asked the boy where their mother kept her savings, And when the boy said he didn't know, the man told him to cover his head with the blanket and not to look, and that if he looked, he would kill him. So the boy did as he was told, and he didn't hear or see anything else. He said soon after he fell asleep again and only saw what had happened to his mother the next morning. So that's... So sad. I just got goosebumps. I mean... (sighs) It's awful. Awful, awful. So the next day, an arrest was made, because obviously we have to make an arrest. We can't just have 
someone running around and terrorizing people, right? Especially with the new newspapers encouraging vigilante justice. Yeah. So the next day they make an arrest, and a 19-year-old African-American boy named Andrew Williams, who was believed to be the attacker, was arrested. And he was arrested because he was barefoot at the time. That's it. At least that was what was named as the main thing incriminating him, according to the press. As if there were not many, many, many barefooted people of all shapes and sizes and colors at the time walking around in the Austin area in May. Definitely. Right. Speaking of newspapers, they really did their best to fan the flames, reporting daily about all of the attacks and murders and speculating about who was the culprit. Andrew Williams, though, turned out to be not the murderer. He was just barefoot and he was let go. And, of course, over the course of the attacks and murders, over 400 people would be arrested in Austin. And we're not going to get into every single one. Just know that the police were really hoping to be able to solve this case because the citizens of Austin were getting more and more critical of their law enforcement. They were not mm -hmm. happy. No. On 22nd of May 1885, a third murder linked to the killer took place. Again, the victim was an African-American woman. Her name was Irene Cross. Irene was born in 1847 in Mississippi and had moved to Austin with her husband, Haywood Cross. The couple had one son, Washington. Unfortunately, Hayward died sometime in the 1870s, and so now Irene was a widow and had to take care of her son. Later, her nephew Douglas Brown would also move in with her, and she would take care of that boy. In 1885, Irene, George, who was already a grown-up at the time, and Douglas, who was most likely 12 or 13, they were living in a small cabin on East Linden Street. Irene and George occupied one room, and Douglas slept in another room adjacent to Irene's room. If I understand correctly, you had to go through Douglas' bedroom to get to Irene's bedroom. On the night of the murder, Washington was not home. He usually came home very late at night. Uh, I assume he was working late, so the door between their bedrooms would be unlocked, because Washington obviously didn't want to wake anybody up when he would come home. The murderer had entered Douglas' room and proceeded to the other room where Irene was sleeping. And I'm sure at first they thought it was just Washington coming home, but soon they were fully awake realizing that there was an intruder in their house. Irene and Douglas started screaming and the attacker ran over to Irene telling her to be quiet and attacking her with a knife or possibly even a razor blade. It's so scary. Mm-hmm. He inflicted a deep wound on Irene's arm, severing her artery. The cut was almost 15 centimeters or 6 inches long and so deep that it almost cut her arm in two. Uh, there was also another deep cut across most of her head, stopping just above her right eye. It was described as looking, quote, as if the intention had been to scalp her, end quote. Douglas, being the only witness, was questioned about what he had seen that night and if he could describe the attacker. He said that the attacker was a big African-American man. He was barefoot and had the legs of his pants rolled up. He was wearing a brown hat and a coat. The only thing that the murderer had said to Douglas was that he should stop screaming because he doesn't want to hurt him. Also, I think it's important to note that... How do I say that? I think Irene died hours after the attack, so not, not immediately. I think a doctor mm. was brought in as soon as all this happened and people heard screaming the attack of lead they brought a doctor but there was just nothing to save her yeah she died around 6 a.m in the morning yeah because even when we covered because this is we're talking late 1800s here and even when we did the shark attacks in 1916 right they didn't have the knowledge then to repair no. severed arteries you know there's just there was no blood in it. there was just nothing it's also interesting that whoever this killer is they clearly don't have the the desire isn't just to kill is it it's a very specific the violence is against women mm -hmm. the violence is not against children not just though we talk about it more next week but yeah we do i don't know don't you have a feeling that maybe it was different murderers like yeah it doesn't all sound like the same person so in between, there were so many cruel attacks in Austin, and we really don't have time to talk about all of them. That would be a whole podcast in and of itself. But as we said, we, you know, read the book and it gives you a lot of information about all of this. 
we're only going to stick with the victims who are believed to have been attacked by the same killer. And we're going to end today's episode with another alleged victim of the Austin Axe murderer. And her name was Clara Dick. This is from the Austin American Statesman, August 23rd, 1885, which was a Sunday, page four. Quote, an inhuman husband attempts to kidnap his child and murder his wife and mother-in-law. Full particulars of the fearful tragedy. Some time between the hour of one and daylight yesterday morning, the neighborhood of North Avenue East was aroused by repeated screams and moans coming from the home of Mr. E.J. Christmas, who lives at 203 North Avenue East in a small one-story frame house surrounded by a yard in front and the rear by houses on the east and west side occupied by colored people. The neighbors ran to the house to investigate the cause of the disturbance. They were completely horrified to find, upon entering the house, Mrs. Clara Dick lying upon the bed, with her skull crushed in, just above the left eye, by a blow from some instrument, blood flowing from her wounds, and she in a state of unconsciousness, while her mother, Mrs. Rebecca Christmas, was bleeding profusely from a wound on the right arm. The young baby of Mrs. Dick was screaming with pain, and a scene of unutterable horror and confusion reigned supreme. It was learned that Charles Dick, the husband of Mrs. Clara Dick, had visited the house a few moments before, and reaching through the window in his wife's room, had made an attempt to kidnap the baby, failing in which he struck his poor wife on the forehead with a hatchet, crushing her skull, bruised up her mother who ran to the assistance of her daughter, and then fled. Upon investigation, it was found that Mrs. Dick was sleeping near the window in the West Room at the time of the accident. Accident? Okay. (laughs) This window is just two and a half feet from the ground, and the inhuman brute had stood on the ground and accomplished his hellish work. End quote. It's not the finest reporting that we've read, but you get the gist. So, witnesses to the attack were not only Clara, but also her parents, Rebecca and E.J. Christmas. They all testified that Charles Dick, Clara's estranged husband, was the attacker, that they had separated a couple of months earlier after Charles being physically abusive towards his wife. He had then moved to Waco. After the attack, Clara took a while to recover physically as well as emotionally, but we're glad to tell you that the baby was physically fine except for some minor injuries. I can't believe Clara recovered, actually. It's kind of a miracle. Charles was arrested and charged with attempted murder. He was granted a bail of $500, which would be like $15,500 in today's money. And he stood trial in the fall of 1885. He could, however, prove to the jury that he had an alibi. He had witnesses testify that he had been in Waco on the night of the attacks, and so Charles Dick was let go. Clara's attack was now another unsolved crime in Austin, Texas. And next week, we're going to tell you all about the rest of the victims and some of the theories about who did it. See, that's one of the reasons. I mean, there are three witnesses saying that this attacker was Charles Dick, the husband, right? Yeah. And yes, okay, he had witnesses who testified he was in Waco, but I think one was his brother. Okay. I mean... I know. So I'm I'm still... Not sure. Also, why the Swedish maids were counted as victims of the of the same killer when a gun was used. Yep. It's so... Well, we're going to talk more about it next week. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Also, it's not like the police are going to want to be like, you know what? Actually, these are all... There isn't one person out there. These are all different people. Exactly. <laughs> and of course, you're going to have... Plenty of, you know, and we're, again, we're going to talk about this more next week, but you're going to have people copycatting to yeah. to do away with people. So, And I mean, the, the descriptions vary so much in the incidents. He was a black man. No, he was a white man. He was an Asian man. It was yeah. two attackers. No, there were several. And I was shot. Yeah. I was stabbed. I was axed. Yeah. I was, you yeah. know. A stone. They yeah. hit me with a stone. They hit me head. with yeah. a rock. They asked for money. They didn't. Uh, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. What's your something good? My something good is that my husband is home for vacation right now. Yay. Yeah. Let's wrap That's this really up good. so you can get back to 
<laughs> what's your something good? I mean, uh, I know what's your something my good. Trip, my trip. I have, oh my goodness. I have so much to tell all of you and we're not going to talk about it really today. I'm just going to say that it went really better than I could have hoped. It was, everything went so well. My dad had a great time. It just was so nice to see everybody. I think everybody really had a, had a nice time. Did you like Norway? I cannot wait. We all want to go back to Norway. Mm. I can't even, I'm, I am literally now pining for the fjords. I am, I've done it and now I'm pining and shall be forever pining. It is, it is, I was a little afraid going into it. Again, like I said, when we went to the Hotel Dell, like you see these pictures and you see these images and you just think, well, we'll see. But no, it's like, it's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. It was amazing. And the sun never set, which was weird. Mm. So I was up every night till like 2 a.m. I'm so tired right now. I'm like, <laughs> now that my body's like relaxing. I'm so glad you had a great time. I knew yeah. you were gonna. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, please do us the huge favor. Go to your podcast app and check if you can leave us a rating and or review. They mean so much to us. They make our day. And also they are very important so that other people can decide if they want to listen to us or yeah. not. Also, please don't forget, starting from tomorrow, 1st of July, go to podcastawards.com, register. Check the box that you want to be considered as a final voter and vote for us in Best Female Hosted, True Crime, History, and People's Choice. Please and thank you. If you are looking for ways to contact us, uh, go to our webpage. You find our PO box there and our email address, which is freshhillpodcast at gmail to at gmail.com. You also find a link to our merch store, which is a new merch store. Go check it out. We had we have some fun new stuff there. I'm very excited to go check it out because that went live when I was away. So I'm going to go shopping now. Yeah, I need all new merch. You find a link to Patreon. Uh, you can support us there. We don't have a link yet for our Podbean Patreon program. That's just completely new. You can find it on the Podbean app or on the webpage if you find us there. Uh, what else? We have a Discord server. We're also gonna put that link up soon. I'm trying to, you know, have a second place where we can communicate in case Facebook will ever shut us down because sometimes they don't like that I posted a photo of Pablo Escobar 50,000 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah, Facebook has a lot of interesting ideas about promoting violence. I think that's it. Please tell your pets we said hi, hug them, cuddle them, uh, give them enough water, keep them inside, keep them cool, don't leave them in the car if you're no. somewhere where it's hot at the moment, very, very dangerous, take them to the vet if something is wrong. They are the best pets, you're everything they have, take good care and please send us photo because we always want to see your pets. That's right. And as it's getting warm, remember, if you do have a pet that's overheating, don't splash freezing cold water on them because that will put them into shock. You want to just put room temperature wet towels, to cool, which will cool them down, wrap around their paws, but no freezing cold water. Yeah, also don't put them over over the, the dogs, for example. Put the, the wet towels under them or, as yeah. Annie said, on yeah. their paws on because their they paws. can overheat like that. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Be kind to your fellow human being. If you think it's a dangerous situation, of course, don't be kind. Listen to your instinct. You know what oh, I'm yeah. saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But like, give regular people the benefit of the doubt. If you think exactly. someone's going to murder you, fuck that person. But like, <laughs> in your day to day, just assume everyone's having a shittier day than you and try to make it better. Be kind to yourself because that's the hardest part of it all. It really and is. that's it. It really is. Do you know what happened actually about that? Speaking yeah. of which, do you remember? I do you remember I told you how my therapist wanted me to write, ask people to write things down, and I didn't want to do it. And you left that in that episode. Well, my cousin heard that, and so when I got home, I got a card saying how much everybody loves me, and I got a jar, and in it, I haven't opened it yet. I can't even think about opening it without crying. But every single one of my family who came on the cruise wrote me a note about why they love me because of my Aww. cousin Amy. She's the best. So, yeah. Oh my God. So I know. sweet. So sweet. I have the best people. So See, it was lucky. good I left it in there. It was. 
Yeah. <laughs> but we love you all listening. We missed you. And did we cover everything? Is that it? I think so. All right. Well, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. See you next week. 